When you read a news article and you say to yourself, this is too outrageous to be true, chances are it probably is. But when it actually turns out to be true, chances are it's an outrageous injustice. <laughs> Viva Fry, Montreal litigator turned YouTuber, and it is vlog time. I first heard of this story because subscribers were DMing me, sending me message to the effect that I should cover this story. And when I first read the articles, I said to myself, no, this can't be the whole story. There has to be something else to this story to explain what is otherwise a patently gross injustice. The story is about a man named Willie Nash, married father of three, who was sentenced to 12 years in prison for possessing a cell phone in a correctional facility. A man who was only booked on a misdemeanor charge was found in possession of a cell phone, found guilty of possessing a cell phone in a correctional facility, and sentenced to 12 years in prison. If you haven't already heard of the story, you're probably saying the exact same thing to yourself that I said to myself when I first read about it. This is impossible. It's impossible. It's impossible. There has to be something else to the story. Well, it turns out that there is in fact something else to the story, but not something to explain the 12 year sentence, something to make it even more shocking. It's not even as though Willie Nash smuggled in the cell phone. He was booked and he went through a strip search to get into the correctional facility. It's not even as though Willie Nash tried to hide the fact that he had the cell phone in the correctional facility. Indeed, the only reason he got caught in the first place was because he asked one of the guards if he could have some juice for his phone. The guard then confiscated the phone as the guard ought to have done when they were booking Willie Nash in the first place. Charges were pressed, a trial was held, Willie Nash was found guilty, and the judge sentenced Willie Nash to 12 years in prison on charges that carried a maximum sentence of 15 years. Not only was Willie Nash found guilty and sentenced to 12 years, but his sentence was confirmed in appeal. Now I know what some of you are asking yourselves, did Willie Nash have any prior convictions that could have explained this harsh sentence? And the answer is yes, Willie Nash had prior convictions. He had served time for burglary, but apparently hadn't been in jail for upwards of eight years while he was getting his life back on track until he was booked on this misdemeanor charge. But the answer is yes, Willie Nash did have priors, which the judge took into consideration when sentencing him, and we will get into all of this when we read through the judgment that confirmed the original conviction and sentencing, which we're going to do right now. In the Supreme Court of Mississippi, Willie Nash versus State of Mississippi, court from which appealed attorney for appellant, attorney for appellee, etc., etc. A jury found Willie Nash guilty of possession of a cell phone in a correctional facility. Nash does not appeal the jury's verdict. He only challenges his sentence 12 years in prison. He claims the 12-year sentence is grossly disproportionate to the crime and thus violates the Eighth Amendment. And what is the Eighth Amendment? It is the Eighth Amendment of the United States Constitution that prohibits excessive bail, excessive fines, or cruel and unusual punishment. <laughs> And the argument here is going to be that being sentenced to 12 years in prison for possessing a cell phone in a correctional facility, especially under the circumstances of this case, qualifies as cruel and unusual punishment. Though harsh, Nash's sentence falls within the statutory range of 3 to 15 years. And the judge based his sentencing decision on the seriousness of Nash's crime and evidence of Nash's criminal history. Because Nash has not shown that a threshold comparison of the crime committed to the sentence imposed leads to an inference of gross disproportionality, no further analysis is mandated. Now, in order to appreciate the patently obscene injustice of this case, we need to get into the facts. It's not as though Willie Nash surreptitiously smuggled in the cell phone knowing that it was a crime to do so. It's not as though Willie Nash concealed the fact that he had the cell phone once he was booked in the correctional facility. It's not even the case that Willie Nash was up to nefarious deeds with his cell phone that he possessed in the correctional facility. But don't take my word for it, let's just read through the summary of the facts in the appeals decision. While confined at the Newton County Jail on a misdemeanor charge, Nash asked a jailer for, quote, some juice, end quote. At first, the jailer thought Nash was asking for something to drink. But then Nash slid across a cell phone that he had on his person. On his person is fancy legalese for on him. The jailer took the phone and gave it to the sheriff's deputy in charge. Nash later denied the phone was his. But when the deputy sheriff unlocked the phone, using the code Nash had given the jailer, he found photos of Nash as well as a text message exchange from the day Nash had handed over the phone in jail. The incoming message asked WYA, short for where you at? and the outgoing message responded, in jail. A jury convicted Nash of possessing a cell phone in a correctional facility in violation of Mississippi Code Section 475193, REV 2015. Any person who violates Section 4753, quote, shall be guilty of a felony and upon conviction shall be punished by confinement in the penitentiary for not less than three years, nor more than 15 years. Now this crime is in fact a felony crime as opposed to a misdemeanor charge, so it is more serious and susceptible of longer prison sentences. Now you might be asking yourself why it's such a serious felony charge 
charged to possess a phone inside a correctional facility or a prison. And in order to understand it, we have to read through the actual crime because it's not just limited to cell phones. This felony charge of possession of certain items in a prison facility actually applies to weapons, drugs, etc. It is unlawful for any person or offender to take, attempt to take, or assist in taking any weapon, deadly weapon, unauthorized electronic device, contraband item, cell phone, or any of its components or accessories to include, but not limited to, subscriber information module, SIM cards, or chargers on property within the state belonging to the department, a county, a municipality, or other entity that is occupied or used by offenders, except as authorized by law. So now you see that cell phone is but one of the items enumerated, and you can easily understand why the punishment would be so severe for weapons or deadly weapons. But it's worth mentioning something that the sentencing judge said. Based on Nash's prior burglary convictions, he could have been indicted as a habitual offender. This would have subjected him to a 15-year sentence to be served day for day. The trial court sentenced Nash below the statutory maximum to a term of 12 years in custody of Mississippi Department of Corrections. Appreciate that comment how you will and for what it's worth. Just bear in mind that we have the judge saying, consider yourself fortunate. I didn't sentence you to a full 15 years for possessing a cell phone in a correctional facility. Paragraph 5, Nash filed a motion for new trial challenging the sufficiency of the state's evidence and the trial court's evidentiary rulings. The court denied this motion and Nash appealed. On appeal, Nash challenges his sentence only. He argues his 12-year sentence violates the Eighth Amendment to the United States Constitution because it is grossly disproportionate to his crime of possessing a cell phone in jail. Now, as relates to the proportionality of the sentence with respect to the crime committed, Nash raises an interesting argument. He asks the court to conclude what he refers to as different degrees of transgression of the actual crime itself. The argument here is that the statute lists the prohibited items in order of severity. Any weapon, deadly weapon, unauthorized electronic device, contraband item, then cell phone. Thus, the cell phone is a less serious prohibited item as opposed to the weapon, deadly weapon, unauthorized electronic device, and contraband. And as such, the sentencing should be less severe for the cell phone as opposed to possessing a weapon. But the court swiftly dismisses this argument. Paragraph 9, but the statute's language does not support his three-tiered argument. Nothing in the language of section 47.5.193 suggests the legislature intended to assign different levels of severity or punishment depending on whether one possessed a weapon, contraband, or a cell phone. Rather, section 47.5.195 explicitly treats all violations of section 47.5.193 equally. And you can't really disagree with the court's reasoning here. This seems to be what the law says. The only real issue would be in the mind and heart of the judge rendering the sentence would the fact that we're dealing with a cell phone and not a deadly weapon not play into the sentencing. And not only did that not play into the original sentencing, the original judge thinks Willie Nash should count himself lucky for not having been sentenced to a full 15 years for possession of a cell phone. And then at paragraph 11, the court goes on to write as follows. Nash's 12-year sentence fell within the statutory range. And, quote, the general rule in this state is that a sentence cannot be disturbed on appeal so long as it does not exceed the maximum term allowed by statute. Wow, and what a concession in the name of justice. You only get to appeal a sentence when it exceeds the maximum allowed by law. And with respect to the proportionality of a 12-year sentence for possessing a cell phone in a correctional facility, the court writes as follows. Paragraph 17. While obviously harsh, Nash's 12-year sentence for possessing a cell phone in a correctional facility is not grossly disproportionate. Now I'm sitting here reading this and I'm just seeing a foregone conclusion. The court is arguing from the conclusion that the sentence, although harsh, 12 years in prison for possessing a cell phone is not grossly disproportionate. That conclusion, however, implicitly recognizes that there could be a sentence that would be grossly disproportionate for the crime of possessing a cell phone in a correctional facility. And while this conclusion implicitly recognizes that, I'm sitting here reading it wondering what that sentence would be. As relates to this particular crime, there's only a difference of three years with respect to the maximum sentence. So what sentence for this crime would in fact be grossly disproportionate to the crime? We don't know, we never will know, the court simply goes on to affirm the original sentence. Paragraph 18, we affirm Nash's conviction and sentence. Now an interesting thing in this judgment is that we have a specially concurring opinion by presiding Justice King. And King writes as follows. I agree that with regards to Nash's sentence, this court has reached the correct result under our case law. However, I write separately to voice my concern over this case as a whole. It seems to demonstrate a failure of our criminal justice system on multiple levels. First, it is highly probable that the Newton County Jail's booking procedure was not followed in Nash's case. An officer at the jail testified that all inmates were strip searched when booked although that officer did not book Nash. Yet Nash went into the jail with a large smartphone that would have likely been impossible to hide during a strip search. That officer also testified that all inmates were told during booking that they could not bring phones into the jail. But Nash's behavior was that of a person who did not know this, as he voluntarily showed the officer his phone and asked the officer to charge it for him. The optimist in me wants to believe that Justice King made these remarks to give fodder for an appeal. Now I have no idea what happened at the original trial, what evidence was adduced, what evidence was not adduced. But by the judge's remarks here, 
here we see at the very least contributory fault by the correctional facility, if not outright fault. If procedure wasn't followed, if an inmate was allowed into jail with his phone with no warning to the effect that it was illegal to do so, I might argue that not only do you have contributory fault, but you might have something akin to entrapment. If the correctional facility doesn't do its job properly, it's going to be the inmate that gets punished for it. One does not have to have a hyperactive imagination to just conceive of how this might be abused. But setting all that aside, what you have here at the very least is contributive fault to the situation by the correctional facility. Contributive force by the correctional facility, but the full force of the hammer of justice falls on the head of the inmate. And speaking of not knowing how the original trial was conducted, let's go to paragraph 22. Second, the officer who booked Nash the night before the cell phone incident did not testify at trial. Again, not knowing what was done or not done or why it was done or not done at the original trial, I can't comment on that. What I can tell you in my experience as a lawyer is that when a judge writes something like this in the judgment, generally speaking, it is to slap the wrist of the lawyer who conducted the file. It is a not so subtle critique of how the file was conducted. Why did you not call that witness to testify? If you didn't think it was relevant, I am telling you now by this comment, it was relevant. It is consequently unknown whether booking procedures were actually followed in Nash's case. Furthermore, had this officer testified that booking procedures were followed for Nash, he could have been questioned on cross-examination about how he possibly missed a large smartphone during a strip search. It seems problematic to potentially allow someone into jail with a cell phone and then prosecute that person for such action. And reading this, I am left sitting here mumbling to myself, well, this is all fine and well, but how did you just go about and actually confirm that very sentence? Third, I note that Nash's criminal history evinces a change in behavior. Both his previous convictions were for burglary. His last conviction was in 2001 and he was sentenced to serve seven years. So for approximately eight to 10 years, Nash has stayed out of trouble with the law. He has a wife and three children who depend on him. Combining this fact with the seemingly innocuous, victimless nature of his crime, it seems it would have been prudent for the prosecutor to exercise prosecutorial discretion and decline to prosecute or seek a plea deal. The judge writes these words while concurring with the opinion that affirms the original sentence of 12 years in prison for possessing a cell phone that the guards did not find. And in closing, the judge writes as follows. Cases like Nash's are exactly why prosecutors and judges are given wide discretion. Nash served his time for his previous convictions and stayed out of trouble with the law for many years. He has a wife and three children who rely on him. His crime was victimless and the facts of the case lend themselves to interpretation that his crime was accidental and likely caused by a failure in booking procedures. Nash did not do anything nefarious with his phone and he certainly did not hide his phone from law enforcement. While I do not think that the court can find under the law that the trial court abused its discretion in sentencing, it is a case in which, in my opinion, both the prosecutor and the trial court should have taken a more rehabilitative rather than punitive stance. In other words, shame on everybody, but there's nothing I can do because the law is the law. But to end on something of a positive note, all hope is not yet lost. The SPLU, the Southern Poverty Law Center, has filed a motion for rehearing. And in that motion for rehearing, which we're going to go over very quickly, they raise a number of arguments, all of which we've already discussed. Embodied in the Constitution's ban on cruel and unusual punishment is the precept of justice that punishment for a crime should be graduated and proportionate to the offense. The SPLU is raising the argument that it was the correctional facility's fault for not properly searching Willie Nash. Nash's cell phone possession was involuntary because he was not searched according to jail policy. Nash cannot be convicted for something that he did involuntarily. The second argument they raise is based on the proportionality of the sentence to the crime. The Eighth Amendment requires proportionality. Nash's 12-year prison sentence for possessing a cell phone because his jailers failed to search him violates the proportionality requirement. And then we go into some in-depth discussion about the applicable case law, but we don't really need to go into that for the purposes of this vlog. Suffice to say that under the applicable case law, there is a three-pronged test to determine the proportionality of the sentence to the crime that was committed. Prior to Harmelin, Solem had established the three-part test to be used in gauging a sentence's disproportionality. First, we look to the gravity of the offense and the harshness of the penalty. Second, it may be helpful to compare the sentences imposed on other criminals in the same jurisdiction. Third, courts may find it useful to compare the sentences imposed for commission of the same crime in other jurisdictions. The SPLU then goes on to argue that there's no penological theory to justify the harshness of a 12-year sentence for that crime. No one disputes that prohibiting cell phones in jails is a legitimate goal. The question is not whether criminalizing the possession of a cell phone in prison necessarily violates the Eighth Amendment. It does not. The question is whether a 12-year prison sentence is legitimate for someone who possessed a cell phone only because his jailers failed to search him. It is not. The SPLU then goes over the four goals of sentencing. The four goals of sentencing are one, rehabilitation, two, retribution, three, separation from society, and four, deterrence, both general and specific. First, such a remarkably long sentence is not needed to rehabilitate Nash. Second, the sentence achieves no retributive effect. Nash's actions were victimless, so there is no retribution to be accomplished. Third, there is no need to separate Nash from society for 12 years. Possessing a cell phone that one's jailers fails to discover is not the sort of behavior that society must 
must be protected from for upward of a decade. And fourth, perhaps most importantly, sentencing Nash to 12 years carries no deterrent effect at all. To the contrary, such a stunning sentence for such innocuous behavior is more likely to result in prisoners concealing cell phones rather than offering them up as Nash did, lest they meet Nash's fate. I would even add the argument that not only does it not carry any deterrent effect whatsoever, it does the exact opposite. This might actually cause inmates to do exponentially more serious things to avoid being caught with a cell phone to avoid this very fate. Just to end by reading the conclusion. Nash neither smuggled his cell phone nor concealed its existence. His case lacks any suggestion of bad faith or voluntariness. Sentencing him to 12 years because his jailers failed to search him is cruel and unusual. Vacating Nash's sentence requires no sweeping changes to precedent. The facts that led Nash to this court make his case incredibly rare, if not unique. Nash never concealed his cell phone. It might never have been discovered if Nash had not offered it up. Nor might his ownership have been established if Nash had not given his passcode to unlock it. Nash did everything right sentencing him to 12 years for that behavior is not merely harsh, it is perhaps unprecedented. Even in Mississippi, which appears to be one of three American jurisdictions that conceivably allow such long sentences, no case resulting in a comparable sentence has arisen from comparable facts. The court should grant Nash's motion for rehearing, vacate its decision dated January 9, 2020, reverse his conviction, and render a judgment of acquittal. Alternatively, the court should grant Nash's motion for rehearing, vacate its decision dated January 9, 2020, vacate Nash's sentence, and remand his case to the Newton County Circuit court for resentencing. So that is the vlog. If you are not aware of this situation, now you are aware of it and you can do something about it if you want. The law may be the law, but sentencing someone to 12 years in prison under these circumstances is an absolute injustice. If you want to see another great vlog, check out my vlog where I break down the dismissal of Vern Unsworth's defamation lawsuit against Elon Musk. I'm going to link it right there. YouTube originally demonetized that video for use of a certain word, so I went ahead and did a second re-edit of it, which was itself demonetized, so it got absolutely no discoverability on the platform. So go watch that video, and if I may ask, tweet it to Elon Musk because I would love him to watch it. And if you like my videos and content, please be sure to like, share, subscribe, hit the notification bell, drop a comment in the comment section below. If you want some merch, all merch and support links are in the pinned comment, and now you know your vlog. Peace out. Booyah!